Hi, this is Kim Hallen with Unbridled, and welcome to Episode 5 of Tempo's Journey of Emotional Healing. As we begin this episode, I wanted to do a quick review of the timeline of the events that I've talked about so far. So Tempo was born in 2007, and then she spent most of 2008 in the stall recovering from her bone cyst. And then the three-year period from 2009 to 2011 was a period of a lot of ups and downs for us as I just continued to um, try to you know, get back to the training I'd been doing with her prior to her injury and return her to both physical and emotional health. And at that time, I was just using, trying to use the two training methods that I was very familiar with, which was both positive and negative reinforcement um, in the form of clicker training and natural horsemanship. And then the years of 2012 through 2014, those two years were the years when I focused heavily on constructional approach training for horses or CAT H. As you can imagine, being confined to even a large stall for eight months during a critical time of growth for a young horse left Tempo very stiff throughout her body. So even after she got the all clear from the vet that her bone cyst had fully healed and that she was no longer lame in that leg, she was um, still not comfortable physically. And unfortunately, because she was so defensive about her body, I really couldn't do any body work with her that involved touching her. So no massage or chiropractic or acupuncture, things like that. So I spent a lot of time just trying to help her recenter and rebalance her body using movement. So a lot of stretching and um, flexibility exercises. And, you know, we did make some progress, but she still to this day is a very stiff horse compared to one that has not gone through some kind of physical trauma like she did. And when you look at these pictures, you'll see that we had a lot of moments um, that were lovely. And once I got Tempo into a training session, things um, sometimes would go very well. Other times they didn't, or sometimes it was like working with uh, Jekyll and Hyde, <laughs> where we'd be doing well for a few minutes or a little while, and then suddenly things would turn bad. But um, we just did our best during this time. Amazingly, given how sensitive Tempo was to being touched, I was able to introduce her successfully to the saddle using clicker training. Now that doesn't mean that it went smoothly and this was one situation where we had a lot of the Jekyll and Hyde behavior where she would be calm one minute and then really upset the next and then calm again. So I spent a tremendous amount of time getting her comfortable with a saddle. When I felt the time was right, I did even start her under saddle. In fact, this was the first time I ever sat on her. And, you know, all I can say about this period was that um, I had to learn how to transition uh, back and forth between different training methods and to try to just provide whatever support Tempo needed emotionally in the moment in order to keep us both safe. Uh, but, you know, we, we made progress and that felt good. But even though sometimes the training sessions would go well, when I would come out to see her just in the pasture, um, and even if still when I would come to the fence sometimes, the aggression was still there, always. Um, that never healed throughout this period. I could manage it, as I've said before, but it was always there, and working with her was always um, a struggle, no matter what we did. In 2012, when I got connected with the group via Zen Horsemanship, it was such a relief to me because I finally had other people who understood what it was like to work with a horse that was really volatile. And they helped me um, focus on safety first above everything else. It was this group who helped me understand that in order to be safe with tempo, the first thing I needed to do was reconnect her with her flight instinct. In other words, we needed to remind her that it's okay to just walk away. This clip will show you what I mean by that. So here I was having a nice interaction with Puck, Tempo's mom, and you see Puck start to move away, and that's because um, a very grumpy Tempo was coming in. And Tempo kind of pushed not only into my space, but Puck's, and watched Puck kick at Tempo there. 
And then tempo kind of gets emotional and, and loses it. Um, and then I'm trying to protect my space by flapping my arms, but you can see that tempo puck leaves as soon as I start flapping my arms, but uh, tempo doesn't. And this is just evidence that she, she didn't realize that she could walk away when she was frustrated or feeling emotionally overwhelmed. In fact, even when I walked away a little, she still came back into my space again. She kind of circled, partially circled me here. We used to call this her swarming like a shark, but she comes back into my space and you can see she just doesn't really know how to leave. The other two horses are giving me plenty of clearance and she is just staying here. I mentioned before that one of the ways I protected my space with her was to carry a stick and I wouldn't use it to be aggressive with her, but she did respect my space if I had a stick in my hand more than if I didn't. Because the focus of Cat H is working with a horse before they become emotional, I learned that it was really important to practice helping Tempo understand how to walk away before she was emotional. This is an example of one of the ways that I worked on this. And the point was to work on my own energy level, but also to help Tempo get more aware of my energy. And it was simply to ask her to move off um, rather than coming to me in the paddock was for me to just um, walk through particular spaces. So wherever Tempo was standing. I wasn't trying to chase her. I was just saying with my energy, why don't you move out of my space? Uh, and this was just a really changed dynamic for she and I, and it was very helpful. This is another kind of fun example of a way that I worked with her on walking away uh, when something is not comfortable for her. So here I had been giving Puck a nice bath and Tempo often got kind of um, obnoxious when I was giving her mom a bath and would sort of Bogart the, the situation like she's trying to do here. So I would kind of spray her in ways that didn't feel super comfortable <laughs> and kind of say, okay, this is Puck's time for a bath. Um, now, I did not want to ever make Tempo afraid of the water hose because it was wonderful that she loved getting a bath. So I would kind of go back and forth between, you know, a, ba a bath is nice when it's nice, stay here. But then if it gets uncomfortable for you, you know, walk away. <laughs> so he come spraying her in the face and it was like, yeah, okay, choose to walk away. And typically this isn't something I would have thought to do with Tempo because I wanted things to be positive for her. But because her walking away option was broken, I needed to help her re-engage with it. And this was just a really important uh, part of our journey together was, you know, me being okay with making things uncomfortable. But here, you know, there's a fence between us. It's very safe. And, um, you know, when she's being polite here, I'm giving her a nice bath. But um, I'm also taking opportunities in between that to say, look, if it starts to be something you don't enjoy, just walk away. <laughs> And it turns out this lesson is not just important for tempo. How often do we as humans, when we are in uncomfortable situations, forget that we always have the right to walk away, either temporarily or permanently? The other thing that became really clear to me once I started working on helping tempo choose to walk away was that I had been giving her mixed messages. Even though I didn't want her to be aggressive with me, I had not made peace with the fact that the best way for her not to be aggressive with me was for her to simply not be in close proximity with me. So the next step was for me to begin focusing solely on my Cat H work with Tempo. But in the beginning, this was a struggle because I still didn't really have my head around how to do this work. The goal was, as I said before, to begin when tempo was already relaxed. Well, initially I started trying to do this in the paddock with her and we'd already established that um, she was not relaxed when I was in the paddock with her. So these attempts didn't work really well. And um, I was trying to read her body language to help me determine when I should be going forward and when I should be retreating. 
And ideally, I should have been going forward when she looked re looked relaxed, stopping when she showed a sign of, of stress, and then retreating when she signed, showed a sign of relaxation. But because she was already starting at a pretty high level of stress, this wasn't very successful. And you can see here that I had done an, an approach and a retreat that I attempted to do with her. And when I retreated, um, her anxiety level actually went up and, and she got um, started showing more stress behaviors, some of the ones that we've gone over before in the past videos. And this was because... One, I hadn't established enough distance to begin with, and, and the second was I wasn't good enough yet at reading her body language to um, help it become clear to her what was prompting me to either approach or retreat. So the game didn't make any sense to her, and it really just ended up stressing her out more. So you see some of the behaviors we saw in earlier videos of her, you know, nibbling the ground. There's nothing there to eat. Um, you're going to see her start pawing here in a minute. These are all signs of um, increasing stress and anxiety versus um, her calming down or seeing the game as a reward. So this is uh, an example of, of when it wasn't working. <laughs> and I want to be clear that this whole series is not a how-to. Um, video for Cat H. If you are interested in learning how to do Cat H the properly, there is actually a Facebook page called Cat for Horses, Helping Horses Overcome Their Fears. And I encourage you to check it out. There are actually some how-to videos on that Facebook page, and there's also links to buy a DVD that includes footage and instruction about how to do Cat H properly. As for me and Tempo, things started to work a lot better when I started doing our Cat H sessions with a boundary between us. And here you can see uh, the chair on the ground that Tempo had already flipped over when she was showing some stress behaviors. But here um, I'm, I'm walking forward and at this point I'm still not very good at reading her body language and I miss a few signals that I should have used to stop, mainly um, movement of her ears. But at any rate, I finally did stop when I got close and saw both of the ears go back. And then I waited. Tempo's anxiety level went up a little bit as she started looking away from me. And even though it seems like she's looking at something in the distance, that actually was an indicator that um, she was a little more stressed. And so I was waiting for some signal that she was there. She blinked and turned her head back to me. That was a mo movement toward relaxation. So. I retreated. That's an example of how CAT works. Now we're going to fast forward to many months later. And at this point, Tempo and I had transitioned to doing our CAT sessions actually in the makeshift stall or a portion of it. Uh, the stall she'd been in when she was um, injured was 10 feet by 30 feet or the size of three 10 by 10 stalls. And so I had blocked off an area here that was just a 10 by 10 stall with that single board. And the interesting thing with Tempo and I was that Tempo's aggression was a lot less if there was any kind of physical boundary between us, even just a board like this, that obviously she could step or jump over, but that didn't matter. It was more a psychological boundary and um, it, it gave both of us a lot more confidence. So at this point in our cat work, um, I hope you can see how different tempo is. So I'm at a, at a distance from her that I had established already that she could stay fairly calm. And then I would come forward to the last place that we had been able to uh, maintain calm. And if she stayed calm or at the same level of calm while I was there, I would retreat. and. If I wanted to, I could wait for a sign of greater uh, relaxation. So I think in that moment, I had been waiting for a blink before I retreated. But um, at this stage, we're kind of more advanced here. And sometimes I'm waiting for uh, an additional sign of relaxation before I retreat. And sometimes if she just maintains and doesn't escalate, then I immediately retreat as a reward for her, um, you know, not escalating at all emotionally. 
And you can see here now she's able to stay really still. There's some blinking, some ear movement. Um, she's not relaxed here yet, but she's much more relaxed than she had been in the past. Now you see her here starting to do a little bit of eye fluttering. And that was a really key indicator throughout my cat H work with Tempo and then the head bob there. The, the eye fluttering I came to know as Tempo doing some really deep internal work. It's not the same thing as a horse shutting down emotionally and she's certainly not going to sleep, although that could people have mistaken it for that. And I see this in a lot of other horses that I work with now that have a lot of stress and anxiety. And the best way I can describe it is just the horse going internal into a state of, of deep work, getting ready to, um, or in an effort to lay down new mental and emotional tracks. So as, as you've been watching this segment here, I hope you've noticed that she's becoming more relaxed as the session goes on. Her head has been dropping slightly, and overall there is less tension uh, throughout her body. Tempo and I would do this kind of work together as often as possible, and it really became sacred time for the two of us. It was extremely meditative. Notice the change in her demeanor when I ended the session, and you can tell that it really jerked her out of a meditative state almost. Those of you who are familiar with horse training may think that the footage you just saw looks a lot like desensitization or traditional approach and retreat. But I want to be very clear that cat H and desensitization are two very different things. With desensitization, we are repeatedly exposing a subject to an aversive over and over again until the subject becomes non-reactive. In other words, we use desensitization to teach a subject, a horse in this case, to tolerate something. With cat H, the end result is that we actually get emotional switch over from a fearful response to an aversive to relaxed curiosity and eventually friendliness toward the thing that was formerly aversive. The thing that makes cat H so much more powerful than traditional approach and retreat is that the horse dictates both the distance the adversive is from them and the timing of the retreat. And the horse controls these things by its behavior. In my experience working with Tempo, the most important thing about the process of cat H was that Tempo started to feel validated and she felt like her behavior, her body language, which is how horses speak, was finally being heard. What I'm actually going to show you now is about 10 minutes of footage that shows the moment when Tempo achieved switchover. So here you can see that she's exhibiting a lot of calming signals. The mouth movement you saw, the lowering of her head, the shifting of her weight. In the previous segments, you saw that she was standing pretty still, almost like a statue, and only her head was moving. But here we started to get a lot more um, relaxation in her jaw and throughout her body. Here we see her eyes going internal again a little bit more, the fluttering, I mean. And I was pretty sure that I was very close to getting switch over with her, which is why I was filming this day. And I'm really excited that I caught the moments on tape. So I'm just going to talk you through what I'm seeing here. I'm approaching and retreating back and forth at the distance that Tempo had shown me she was comfortable and could handle it. And so when I'm approaching, as long as she is staying relaxed or getting more relaxed, then I'm just simply approaching and retreating fairly quickly. And the retreat isn't so much contingent on higher levels of relaxation as it is just giving her a chance to um, experience me in that proximity. So you saw her look like she got really, you know, alert and looking at something else. Um, I found with Tempo that often before she made a mental transition, she would behave as if she was paying attention to something off in the distance. But I really think that was uh, somehow part of her process. And if you notice when she came back to looking forward, her head is angled closer to me. Her energy is more um, 
trying to move into me, more receptive than it was before. And you can just see her working on this and saying, gosh, I'm starting to feel differently. I don't quite know how to handle it. Um, you know, I've had my defenses up against this for so long. And what I really want you to see here is just, we've been doing this work for months and months and months at this point. And this is what I was saying at the beginning of episode one. I could not do the work of internal transformation for tempo. That healing process had to happen just her on her own. All I could do was set up this situation that encouraged her to work on it and that created a structure and an environment where she felt safe to work on it. And look at her. She's working really, really hard on healing here and setting down new ideas and new thoughts about the situation. Now, as we go into this next section of footage, I want you to notice how Tempo begins stomping with her front feet. I came to understand through observing her during all of this Cat H work that stomping means she is ready to move on to the next thing or that she's getting ready to. It's a signal of forward progress, um, almost like let's get on with it or I'm ready to get on with it. This is very different than pawing with their front feet. Pawing is a sign of anxiety and of saying I can't handle something whereas stomping, see stomp as I came forward and then she looks toward me stomping again, stomping again. This is her outward body language of what was happening internal which was her saying I'm ready to move on to the next step. And you're going to see how this plays out here. So I move forward. And she stomps and she looks toward me again. Now, at the time, I wasn't 100% sure what this meant. I was just allowing it to happen and I was noticing it. And the key to cat H is letting the horse be in control. So even though I was feeling like she might be ready for me to touch her and to receive touch in a positive way, I knew it was important for her to be the one to um, initiate that. Notice again, the head's getting lower, more relaxation in the body. And she's just working on this so hard and you know, this had been baggage she was carrying around and defensiveness she was carrying around for years. Look at her nostril. Um, you can see the tension she's wanting to let out, but she's just holding it in her nostril there. Horses are completely honest in their body language, and it's a beautiful thing. And if we just learn to watch it, we can understand so much about them. One of the most amazing things about the Cat H process and all the time that Tempo and I spent quietly together in this meditative state, observing each other and getting to know each other, was that not only did it help Tempo heal and to feel more in control of what was happening, but it also helped me learn how to let go of control how to just allow what was happening, how to be with her in a supportive and empathetic way without controlling. Uh, now here, notice she, she starts to circle and that was a, a pattern that I saw throughout the months of our work that often was a precursor to a big emotional shift is she would do a circle and come back. And again, I would just allow that. It was a nice relaxed circle. There wasn't any sign of stress. So I just continued in my approach and retreat that was very comforting to her at this point and that she could trust. Now you see her get kind of alert again. And in fact, I even look to see if she's looking at something important, but that's that same pattern that I mentioned before that often before a big emotional transition, she would get really alert. 
Now you saw the stomp and she put her head there and I couldn't resist but reach for her a little and you saw her receive it and then she said no by moving her head away. I really probably should not have reached for her there but I was just so (sighs) feeling so warm in the moment that she had actually reached for me Um, and that was the first time in all of these months of work that she had actually made an effort to reach toward me. So, but I realized that I shouldn't have done it and I went back to what she trusted and you see the, the, the licking and chewing that happened there, which is an effort to, um, calm herself. And it was in response to me, um, going back to what was comfortable and what she felt in control of, which was not me touching her. But that moment where we did touch (laughs) was a really big moment and you can see that she, goes into a period where she needs to take some time to process that and she starts doing the eye fluttering again there's still a little bit of stomping there which was an indicator that she's still thinking about forward progress more licking and chewing again continuing to bring her energy down and to process what just happened you can see her again through the stomping and the eye fluttering (laughs) look at that repetitive stomping is just she's like oh we need to move forward I need to get on with this need to move on to the next thing but here's a little anxiety left I can't quite do it yet and I just continue with the approach and retreat and that continues to set up a situation where she gets to work on it in small doses you see the head lowering here these are all really good signs now her head is facing me again a little bit more but yet, oh, I can't quite do it. I think I need to let out a little, mo- let off a little more anxiety. So she's still conflicted here, and we're getting some mixed signals. And she moved a little bit away again, but not for long. Then a stomp, some stomps. She's coming back. Her ear is coming toward me. There we go. So this time, she can handle it. And she touched me, and then I met her with my hand. And then you see her go a little over threshold again. So putting her head over mine, that was one of the things she did that was kind of um, uh, frustration and wanting to be in control. And so here, the interaction starts to get a little edgier. And I wasn't quite sure what to do. So I was letting her take the lead and I said, let me just see if I can end with a soft touch. And she takes it, but then she kind of moves out of the way and moves off. We see the anxiety going up. And so I decide to end it there. The footage I've shared with you in today's episode was a major breakthrough for us. It was the first sign of actual emotional switchover. And although we still had a long journey ahead, we now had a shared language and tools for moving forward.